and I was exploring uh, the uh, university library when I found a room underneath the library in the basement of the library wow. uh, that contained all these old alchemical texts, manuscripts, and they dated back to like the 14th century. Alchemists aren't manipulating reality. We're setting the stage for reality to manifest in a pure form. So I was crossing at Checkpoint Charlie, and you know, every time I crossed, it was recorded. And I didn't know the government was recording it that much. But my brother was in the Air Force. Alchemists were chemists, you know. They knew how to, to use psychoactive compounds, and uh, they were used uh, by the alchemists to try and break it through into a new reality. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Onnit, O-N-N-I-T dot com. Onnit is all about total human optimization. They are a treasure trove of nutritional supplements and strength and conditioning equipment. So yeah, if you care about the quality of this meat sack you're lumping around, this physical consciousness container called the human body, and you want to invest in the integrity of that, as well as just feel great. Um, you might care to check it out, and they also have a new coffee line called Fuck Yeah Coffee. No joke. That's how you know it's good. So, um, onnit.com, enter the offer code Philosophical Minds at checkout to save yourself up to 10% off any and all supplements. The future is a concept. It doesn't exist. As the proverb says, tomorrow never comes. There is no such thing as tomorrow. There never will be. Because time is always now. Welcome to the Philosophical Minds Podcast, the podcast about the stuff we wonder about and other things. All right, we're here with uh, Dennis William Hawk. He is a Rosicrucian author, alchemist, translator, mathematician, and a balanced and humble man. How are you doing today, Dennis? Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for being here. Um, so, Rosicrucianism, or Amorc, uh, the ancient mystical order of the Rosicrucis. I'm, I'm very interested in this order for many reasons. First, the subject matter uh, with alchemy, Kabbalah, Hermetic philosophy, mystical Christianity, and just the people of the order, such as yourself, and those in the past that uh, appear to have been associated, such as, uh, I believe, Michael Faraday, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, Francis Bacon, Da Vinci, Notre Dame, Rudolf Steiner, Newton, Mozart, Goethe. Would you please describe what Rosicrucianism is and or what it means to be a Rosicrucian? Uh, Rosicrucian is a uh, philosophical movement, and uh, it's pointed in the direction of uh, higher spirituality for mankind. It's a recognition of uh, another sphere of reality that is spiritual in nature, not material. So this duality between above and below is, is a constant theme in, in Rosicrucian teachings and moving into the above and unifying the below and the above are, are themes of the f philosophy. Uh, being a Rosicrucian means being aware of these spiritual uh, realities and trying to incorporate them into life and um, both social, cultural, scientific uh, philosophy and thinking and to actualize spiritual principles in life. So that's the original Egyptian meaning too. Uh, and also the um, when the Rosicrucian movement uh, flourished in the 1500s and 1600s, the Renaissance, uh, these were the same ideas that there exists one mind uh, that, that is not anthropomorphic, but it's more like an energy or an organizing principle. The word that created the universe in uh, in Christian teachings, and so it amalgamates many different religious ideas, philosophical ideas that really came together in Egypt. And then uh, after the Dark Ages were, were rebirthed into the Renaissance. Um, so it's a movement um, that is really a pr pretty simple in its foundations and uh, in, in its work to kind of bring science and religion together and in its work to bring the above and below together in our lives and 
that includes something that is often missed when people discuss Rosicrucian traditions and other hermetic traditions is a union of both darkness and light. So the Rosicrucians um, acknowledge darkness as part of um, reality. And I'm, by darkness, I mean the unconscious. I mean like dark energy, dark matter that is the source of energy and source of our transformative power. So by, if, by ignoring that, it's trying to push that away like we do in, uh, in other religions, in other spiritual traditions, and trying to just strive for the light, going towards the light. Um, the, the movement in alchemy and hermetic teachings is to unify above and below the, likeness, the light and the darkness and to bring into being a new balance in reality. So it, it's, for instance, alchemist and alchemy, again, is where my uh, background lies. And we see in the Rosicrucian teachings and the Rosicrucian alchemist, uh, the thrust of their message was to accept uh, and work with the dark or unknown energies. And that meant in their own personality, like depression and um, uh, dark moods and things like that were actually uh, seen as an opportunity to transform. In other words, it brings you down to a pace, place where you're very real, very grounded. And uh, that was something the alchemists actually, actually used in some of their processes. Uh, I think all this is, is restated very well in uh, Jungian psychology, who uh, recognized the hermetic teachings as uh, psychological truths, too. Wow. Yeah, and it seems like there's some information that can be a little confusing when I get online. I get some conflicting information with some accounts deem H. Spencer Lewis as the founder and other sources say Christian Rosenkreuz. Is there any conflict with that? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think it's just different traditions, different historical ways. I think the purest teachings can be found in Egypt and during the Renaissance. And then, like I say, uh, it's uh, the Rosicrucian teachings in particular split off into uh, various different factions and, and groups, and they were all, I mean, it, it was primarily dependent on the country. France had their own groups, Germany, the Netherlands were very strong in the teachings too, and uh, it just developed historically like that. So it's very natural to have these um, very influential teachings being interpreted in different ways, and um, they spent Sir Lewis had, had, was, was trained in France, basically in the French teachings, and uh, he brought those teachings back to the United States and, and started Amor, uh, and I think those teachings are very pure, um, but others also uh, interpret, there's just slight variations between the Rosicrucian movements that are out there, but uh, I've been active in Amor because I see it as the pure teachings, or at least the the most alchemically related teachings. Um, so, uh, like I said, I came to Amor through alchemy, and it was my uh, studies in alchemy um, where I had actually read the teachings and writings of the alchemists and their references to uh, Rosicrucian ideas, the, the original Fama and and uh, texts of um, Rosenkreutz and uh, teachers like that, yeah. and um, and how it evolved from that. So. I think uh, the, the modern AMOR movement is very close to uh, those original teachings that uh, inspired the alchemists. And I believe there's an account um, that Rosenkreuz, his grave contained a book of Paracelsus. Is that true? That's true. That's true. And uh, Paracelsus was another one of those alchemists. If you read some of his, some of his uh, writings, which can be very obscure, but, but he was... Uh, a deep writer, it requires a lot of interpretation in his writings, but he has direct reference to a lot of the uh, Rosicrucian principles, and he put them into work in uh, in his alchemical, in, in his practical alchemical laboratory work. So he, he's using spiritual principles, and he's grounding them in the uh, um, laboratory work, and in everyday uh, activities, just how that's in really that's the key to Rosicrucian teachings. You have to bring down these spiritual principles and ground them, or activate them in 
in daily life, and that includes politics, that includes family life, that includes education and, and uh, all kinds of social meetings, and that includes the laboratory, that includes cooking. I mean, it's, uh, it's bringing these principles down and making them real. And Paracelsus was a, an expert at this. Uh, he's, the, he's the one really who gave us the, in alchemy, the sulfur mercury salt idea that um, there are basically three principles involved in everything that takes place in a laboratory, sulfur being um, brimstone or representing fire, representing energy, and uh, mercury representing light and the reflective quality of uh, mercury, the metal. Uh, representing mind and light, and uh, salt representing matter or the uh, manifested uh, congelation of these two, matter and light. In other words, we're talking about matter, energy, and light, E equals MC squared. These are the three principles that are everywhere uh, found in the universe, in science and uh, uh, alchemy and uh, spiritual teachings all find this sacred trinity or the three essentials uh, present you can find them everywhere yeah wow is there any connection between the the 18th degree of scottish rite freemasonry and the actual order itself i know that the title of the 18th degree is it's knight of the rose croix so i didn't know if that was related uh, there is a relationship there between uh, uh freemasonry and uh, the rosicrucian teachings it comes through the Scottish Lodge, actually, and uh, there is a melding of the uh, philosophies there that took place, and a lot of the <clears throat> teachings in the Rosicrucian, uh, is, I mean, we're talking the order itself, their degrees, and the degrees of Freemasonry, there's a lot of similarities between them, uh -huh. what type of ideas are presented, what kind of rituals are done, so there is a crossover there. And what are some of the connections or similarities to Martinism? Can you speak to what Martin is, the Martinist order is? I'm not familiar uh, with the Martinist uh, teachings. I haven't been initiated into Martinism, but it, it is another very close hermetic uh, society um, formed in the Madagascar and other places around the world, kind of outside of Europe that came back to Europe um, in the 19th century. and uh, so the, the uh, principles overlap. The principles are shared. I wouldn't even go that far to say. And uh -oh. the Martin disorder today is very, very close to the uh, Rosicrucian Amorc order. Uh, they share a lot of facilities. They share teachers. They share conferences sometimes. And uh, so there's a very close relationship. Okay. And so from a Rosicrucian perspective, what was the function or purpose of the Egyptian pyramids? In the Rosicrucian teachings, they were chambers of initiation. So like the, the Great Pyramid and other pyramids, um, the structure of the pyramid is, again, this idea of a trinity, a holy trinity rising. And the whole symbol of a pyramid is the chemical symbol of fire. In other words, raising up or raising energies. So in the, uh, in the Egyptian teachings back to Akhenaten, there was an initiation performed in the uh, inner chambers of pyramids, not so much for uh, funerary principles. I mean, there's, there's really never been a, a, a connection between, this, despite what um, anthropologists say and Egyptologists, there's never been a real connection between um, the Great Pyramids and funerary processes or burying a pharaoh. There are sarcophagi inside of... Uh, uh, the, the so-called tombs, but they they're almost too large. They're they're I've been there several times to uh, Egypt, um, looking at these and uh, investigating, researching these these facilities, and they're very much initiatory chambers. I think where the energies can be focused, and uh, there's all kinds of um, uh, stories about. Um, uh, Hermes Trismegistus as being an Egyptian priest who led some of these ceremonies and also even Toph the, uh, and the Houthi, uh, the, the gods of Egypt took part in these ceremonies and they were always involved with an expression of light. So light would appear with, during the initiation somehow. And you see that presence of light 
uh, in Rosicrucian and even Freemasonry, some of the, the later uh, rituals, and I, I can't go into detail there, but there yeah. is light involved in those principles. In my reading, um, I was coming across this name, uh, Beverly Randolph, who's the Eleusinian Rosicrucian of England. Have you heard that name? Just, just in reference like you do, I don't, uh, I'm not familiar with her. I haven't met her or anything. Okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that would be uh, the, the English Rosicrucians. Again, it tends to go by country, and mm -hmm. uh, the United States is slightly different than that. Okay. Yeah, my, what sparked my curiosity was the, the Lucinian part and how that was, if that was different in any way. Uh, I'm not sure of that. I wouldn't want to comment on it. Let's get into some alchemy. Yeah. Um, I know you were initiated into alchemy in Europe and you studied under a man named Kurt Godel, who was good friends with Einstein, I believe. Can you tell us a little bit about Godel and who he was, what his personality was like? Uh, yeah, Gerdell, uh, Kurt Gerdell, uh, uh found uh, was a teacher at the University of Vienna, and I went over there to uh, to to study under him. He was gone by then, but he would established a school there in mathematical logic. And um, the thing he had discovered was, uh, and I didn't know it at the time. I went there, I went there out of shock. I mean, when uh, Kurt Gerdell came up with his uncertainty principle, basically. In mathematics, his his theorem of um, uh, complementarity in uh, in logic. In other words, that that some ideas in any logical system, like arithmetic or basically any logical thinking um, uh, um, system, has flaws in it because it can't encompass everything. Uh, there's always Consistencies, there's always um, contradictions, there's always paradoxes in any logical system. And that's what he proved. Uh, so that was very upsetting to mathematicians at the time. There's a whole interesting series of um, events that took place with David Hilbert and other mathematicians where their worlds were just crushed. I mean, uh, it's hard to imagine today what it was like in the 1930s. And when these ideas came out from Gerdell, um, that mathematics was basically flawed. Uh, scientists and teachers at the time were saying that mathematics was the only way to knowledge, and that's why I got in it. That's why. I, that's what I believed. And all of a sudden, the, the rugs pulled out from under you. Uh, there were actually mathematicians com committing suicide. Wow. There were hundreds of math students who changed their majors. There was a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, uh, disappointment, and uh, it was a very hard time for mathematicians when Gerdell wrote his uh, theorems. And I realized um, at the time, and though it took a long time for me to work through his theorem, which is the, lar the longest mathematical theorem in history, uh -huh. but um, you can see that, uh, I won't go into it now, but uh, he had actually proven what he's saying, that these inconsistencies in logic are inherent in any logical system. So that idea and the reason for that idea have very profound implications to the nature of reality. Basically, Gerdell said that, for instance, let's, let's try to take it and simplify it. If you're looking at a chair in a room and you draw a circle around that chair, then that's the the whole universe you want to look at on that chair. But you can never explain that chair without going outside that circle. In other words, how did that chair get in the circuit in, in the first place? Or how was it made? Uh, Kirk Goodell was a very uh, unusual man. He had His mind was focused to the point where well, we can't even uh, grasp how finally he was tuned into reality. And he had a grasp uh, and a talent for finding inconsistencies and in things, uh, for looking for the the uh, the falseness of statements and falseness of uh, impressions and beliefs. He was a great friend of uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, they shared their time at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study and often walked home together. In fact, uh, Albert Einstein said he, that he thought Kurt Goodell 
was the greatest mind alive at the time. Um, and he learned a lot uh, from Gridell. He admitted that. One of the stories that uh, illustrate Gridell's operations, how his mind operated, was uh, his friends were helping him become a citizen to get his citizenship and pass the test. So um, they were coaching him on the politics in America, history of America, and uh, the Constitution. And when he got before the judge to take the allegiance to the United States, the judge asked him if he had any comments or uh, questions about uh, the process. And um, Kurt Goodell said he, do, he had a warning that he found inconsistencies in the U.S. Constitution <laughs> that would allow, allow a dictator to um, take over the country uh, in a legal way. In other words, by, by manipulating and, and taking away the powers of the other branches of government, the, um, the judiciary and the uh, legislatures. By reducing those powers, a president could become a dictator in the United States through legal means. And, um, and that was very upsetting to Gerdell because he believed that America was set up on a perfect triumvirate of powers that balanced each other. And, and that's the way um, they, that, again, that triple principle of Paracelsus we see coming up again and again, that's the way to to make true action take place. And he saw in the Constitution that uh, the founding fathers kind of missed some things that uh, were, were dangerous to the, the future democracy. And he, and he stated them and his friends were trying to, the judge had no idea what he was talking about. And his friends tried to quiet him and, uh, and that's how it kind of ended in an embarrassing silence. But uh, it was uh, very true to, to how Goodell acted. Uh -huh. So you're obviously a man of many talents, and one of which is you, you're a translator, and you, I know you translated a number of manuscripts. Uh, what are some of them that you've translated? I uh, translated some works of Paracelsus and also a lot of the work of um, an alchemist, a German alchemist named Dr. Gottlieb Lotz. Um, he had done a lot of original research into the uh, hermetic origins of uh, alchemy in Egypt. A lot of um, things that uh, had never been before published. And uh, so I wanted to get those out there. And uh, he had a lot, lot to say about the original versions of the Emerald Tablet. And um, I ended up doing a translation of the Emerald Tablet itself that, that's become pretty popular. Uh, the Emerald Tablet was a uh, an influential document, as I've said, but it went through um, kind of a unique history of subterfuge and being lost. In Egypt, at the Alexandria, the uh, Emerald Tablet was one of the scrolls in the library there. Well, it got destroyed in, in burnings by Christian mobs and uh, Roman uh, emperors, and, uh, and that's when the Dark Ages come upon the world. But the original document of the Emerald Tablet and other alchemical teachings were saved by the Arabian alchemists. And so they survived in Arabia. And then with the Moorish invasion of the Spain um, in the 700s, that these documents were brought back into Europe. And eventually by 1200, they were spreading all over the continent. So what we do have is Arabian uh, versions of the tablet that were translated into Latin versions. And that's, that's how they entered the vernacular. And where so the tablet was, was this very influential document. And that's one of the documents that I translated and I felt feel it had the most influence. Absolutely. It seems like that would be an exhausting task. I'm thankful we have people out there like you doing that. Um, were these manuscripts, are they originally in Latin or how many different languages are, are you translating? I translated uh, German, Latin, and Russian documents. Oh. Uh, I, uh, I basically uh, knew German and, and Latin. I learned in, all, all the way from high school. We had Russian in our high school and colleges so, uh, at the time. So it was uh, not hard for me to pick those up. If, I, if you have an interest in something, and there's a reason to learn the language. In other words, there's these wonderful documents out there that you can't read or understand because nobody's translated them. 
Yeah. Uh, it's it's just easier, I think, to to use languages, where it's just learning them for academic purposes. I don't think I I'd be able to do that as much without having this need to to understand things. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the alchemical tradition that you were trained in. When I was at the University of Vienna and uh, studying mathematics, I uh, Vienna has this wonderful old library that dates back to like 1300. And I spent a lot of time in there. Sometimes when I had a question about something, um, I'd go to the library just to look, look around. If I was confused or sad or depressed, I'd go to the library. I think uh, Carl Jung actually talks about this. That he calls it the library ghost. If you go to a library and you have this burning desire for something, Something will pop up in a book somewhere. Something will a book will fall off a shelf sometimes and and open to the right page for you. And I was exploring uh, the uh, university library when I found a room underneath the library in the basement of the library uh, wow. that contained all these old alchemical texts, manuscripts, and they dated back to like the 14th century. Um, they just vellum, beautiful vellum and leather bound books. And um, I opened some of these books and saw the pictures, really the pictures, before I could understand the text. The text was written in this impossible Fokter type, it's called, uh, very ornate lettering that takes a long time to read. But the pictures popped out at me and stood out as being, as carrying a mystery or carrying a secret uh, uh, relating to forces that I was unaware of. I mean, it was really the pictures that drew me in and trying to understand them. So that's what got me interested in alchemy. And then back at the university, I asked around in the chemistry department um, about alchemy. And finally, a professor there uh, turned me on to a, someone who was connected to alchemy, a practicing alchemist, who was actually working in the uh, chemical laboratory there as a technician, and uh, I uh, hooked up with him. His name was Maris Favilla, an Italian alchemist uh, who had worked and had lived in Prague, and then uh, because of the uh, Iron Curtain, he, he moved to Vienna and uh, got away from the communists. So he was a very unusual <laughs> guy, but he was um, willing to teach me if I did chores and things like that for him. So I actually spent about three years apprenticing to him and uh, learning laboratory techniques. We, we traveled, um, did a lot of strange things. We, we went all the way to the Black Forest in Germany uh, once uh, to collect what he called the first matter. Um, mm -hmm. The first matter in alchemy is this dark matter that contains all possibilities. In other words, uh, it's a source of all matter, the common source of matter. And uh, it's kind of between energy, matter, and mind, kind of that trinity in a paracelsus. So it's a perfect embodiment of uh, alchemical ideas. He believed it actually existed. Uh, and remember, at the time, I'm a mathematician, so I'm not, the, not accepting all these ideas from alchemy at the time. But we went to the Black Forest. We traipsed around there for some time. Uh, Maris was actually stopping to urinate in different places. <laughs> because he felt that that connected him with the energy somehow. Sometimes he was dousing kind of with his hands and doing all kinds of strange things that, that I was getting worried about, to tell you the truth. <laughs> but uh, it was quite a trip. And eventually he came to a place where he said, okay, dig here. here here's where we'll find this dark, dark matter, this dark earth, actually. In fact, alchemy comes from the word, the Egyptian word for blackness and darkness. Um, it means from the dark, from the blackness. And um, in the European alchemy tradition, that blackness is in dark, black dirt, undisturbed dirt. And you could, if you got enough of that dirt, you could distill it and work through processes to finally get an elixir of first matter. But in any case, uh, he showed me where to dig. I, I dug, I did my chores and had these burlap bags. We put some dirt in. Uh, actually, when I was digging there, uh, the ground that we came to was very special. It was very cool, very loose, totally really black dirt. 
and uh, I, ex I put away the spade and started digging with my hands. And when I had my hands deep in this black dirt, I felt something move around my fingers. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a root or something like that, but it, it kept moving. I pulled my hands out, and it's a snake uh, curling around my fingers. And I, I, I started screaming and said, it's a snake, it's a snake. And he came up behind me and he says, it's a worm. It's oh, a yeah. worm. And, um, and it was. It was a giant earthworm that only grows in the black forest of Europe. Uh, it was three feet long, I swear, and, and uh, half an inch to three quarters wide. Uh, wow. A huge. It had a. It was so big I could see its mouth open. So, so it was. It was scary. But it was the fact that these large um, birds and insects and uh, life um, grows to uh, uh, unusual sizes and, and proliferates so much in the black forest kind of confirms the ideas that early alchemists had about the black forest. Yeah, that it was a place of first matter. That's really interesting. So anyway, yeah, we we brought the dirt back, and uh, he distilled it. And over the next oh, but three years or so, um, we had a dew that we collected from, from from the parks in Vienna, and it was a big process that went on for a long time. Wow. Has have you guys done any kind of a chemical analysis on the the black matter? Uh, um, Mira. The black matter, uh, the dirt, uh, basically we put it in a digester. So we took the dirt and uh, purified it and went through the operations of alchemy with it. Um, he added uh, herbs and especially like sprouts and uh, new growth uh, roots and things like that to it. Uh, never explained the process to me, but I... I'd learned on my own what, what he was doing. It, um, it was a process of uh, digestion um, and uh, alchemical uh, operations that led to a, a liquid, and uh, that liquid then was distilled, and that's after fermenting. So you added life force. First of all, you create a dead matter where it was pure and reset to its original state, and then you started... Uh, bringing life back into it. So it's kind of the death and resurrection idea. Yeah. And when it's resurrected, it's raised to its highest state through distillation. But the distil distillation, the whole process went on a long, long time. Uh, the, the distillation was constant. In other words, you had to keep a fire going under the distillation and add, add liquid at the right time in a process called cybation. So it was a, a complicated process that went on for three years. He never um, shared the, the final result with me <laughs> wow. after all those years. Uh, but he did have it. Did when I saw him after I left Europe, I came back ten years later to visit, him, and he did show me the final product, which was a kind of an oil in a small flask. And he said that he had the oil tested at the Berlin uh, pharmaceutical. Um, company a large company there and that it had contained uh, healing properties but that's as far as you go it was basically you use that oil to make an elixir uh, it's a pretty standard process in alchemy but uh, i did not get to share any results i was just the stooge i guess at the time. <laughs> i learned a lot from Aristotle, really a lot from his attitude um, and from his uh, the way he uh believed in th unseen things that i mean he believed totally in in the, the ideas that uh, he was working with in a in a concrete way and that's a good word because in egypt there's a, a an idea of interpretation of egyptian teachings called concretism in mm -hmm. other words these uh, the gods of egypt were not just ideas they were everyday real things real entities in their world, kind of like tulpas or uh, creatures created in our minds that become real in the world, uh, like in alchemy, the homunculus and the artificial beings, artificial life forms that uh, that were created with the mind of the alchemist that came came true in reality. So, the idea of concretism is lost to us today. We think spiritual things are just spiritual things, things of our imagination and minds, but Egyptians, ancient Egyptians, 
and alchemists believed that spiritual entities really existed in a concrete form. And they used that idea in their experiments and in their daily lives, too. Wow. And I know, I, I believe you put alchemist on your taxes at one point in the next year. I think you got audited. That's kind of hilarious. <laughs> um, what would you say to someone who's interested in diving into an alchemical practice who comes to you as the experienced alchemist and asks you for your advice? How would you direct them? Uh, I, my advice to, to students, and I've taken on some of my own apprentices, over the years, and we uh, worked a lot with the Alchemy Guild, uh, and we've set up a lot of programs there where, where alchemists can come together and work with each other. Have, we have a lot of conferences and meetings just on alchemy and, and the different uh, progressions of an or paths of uh, hermetic initiation. So, it, it's a, but it's basically a process of wanting to know the truth and of accepting uh, accepting dark things, accepting bad things about yourself, realizing that uh, good and bad behavior is a uh, relative thing in a lot of ways, and that your behavior is an expression of who you are. So it starts with accepting yourself and then accepting the world as the world really is, not, not as the world you know, should be or not as the world would conform to your ideas. Uh, of what's good and bad, of what, what what's a nice outcome and what isn't. It's that Gerdalian idea that um, logic can be a trap, that uh, uh, thinking that if we do this and this and this, that a certain outcome will occur when it's actually, you're just trying to set the stage for the miracle of the universe, the deep mystery of the universe to, uh, to manifest. So the main thing I would, recommend to an alchemist or anyone entering uh, initiation um, let go of that idea that that you're controlling things and work instead to purify the stage and set up the stage for for the mysteries that are always there to unfold before you and in your life so it's a much more humble approach um, than even science uh, we're not alchemists aren't manipulating reality we're setting the stage for reality to manifest in a pure form. That's a, that's a big step for most people. Love that. And now, your brother's security clearance was dropped as well. Is that true? Due to your occupation? My uh, my brother? You mean his security clearance? Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's quite true. When I was in the, uh, Vienna, I was also visiting Prague, which is like the center of alchemy for Europe. In the 1400s, there were all kinds of uh, uh, alchemists there, and that's where the guild got its start. And uh, so I was crossing the border quite a bit. Uh, at that time, it was the Iron Curtain, so you had to be, go through the security check. You could only have um, so much money, and you couldn't have any maps or anything like that. And it was like the, the train trip to Prague. Uh, there were machine gun nests everywhere. That uh, it was a very uh, controlled environment. So I was crossing at Checkpoint Charlie, and you know, every time I crossed, it was recorded. And I didn't know the government was recording it that much. But my brother was in the Air Force at the time. Uh, he had a cushy job in Minot, North Dakota, in a missile silo, where he'd basically go down there and uh, listen to the radio. But he had uh, the ability to to set off a nuclear missile, you know. So wow. um, eventually he was told that he was being transferred because of um, security uh, problems with him. And he was assigned as a painter, to, <laughs> ended up being painting buildings in, uh, in Texas uh, in a very hot, <laughs> dry environment. <laughs> so he, and then he found out that when he got to Texas that it was because um, of my trips behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, very much Vienna at the time was a spy city, you know, and the government was, uh, I, I had no idea they were monitoring things like they did, but uh, that's okay. what happened. My poor brother hasn't forgiven me for that yet. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to touch on vitriol. Um, what's the importance of vitriol 
physically as well as philosophically? Uh, vitriol is a key concept in, in alchemy. It's uh, kind of the liquid fire, uh, but it's also in, a, uh, in the spiritual work too. So in the laboratory, vitriol is oil of sulfur, uh, sulfuric acid. Uh, it's, um, if you have a container, this, this sulfuric acid, which is a very intensely purified, thick, oily substance, um, it's a liquid fire more. I mean, it destroys anything it touches. Uh, uh, it's a, a great way of um, getting, getting rid of things. That, uh, it, it, uh, it reduces things to, to uh, disappear within the liquid. It's kind of like a magical uh, solution to alchemists back in the Middle Ages to have something so powerful. In fact, if you just let a, uh, a vial of uh, vitriol open, it's such a fiery stuff that it absorbs the moisture from the air and will overflow its uh, container uh, and spill out into the laboratory because it's so uh, hydrophilic. But um, a special substance uh, to the alchemist's very, it's the main substance that uh, moved us into the Industrial Revolution and was required in all kinds of alchemical and chemical uh, technology. But on the spiritual level, vitriol too is the liquid fire Within us, it's kind of a secret fire in, in the Eastern alchemy tradition. It's a, a tantric idea that's kind of like sexuality or some deeper burning um, uh, energy over which we have very little control and which can overcome us. Uh, the alchemist tried to actually focus this energy, which is not just sexual energy, but also passion for transformation passion for change, um, love on the spiritual level, love on the physical level. So it's that uh, essential driving transformative energy within us uh, that is the liquid fire of vitriol. So they tried to encourage that energy within themselves. In other words, to go back to a time, if necessary, where these energies were pure and innocent and to um, transmute them from there. So in the, on the Eastern side, in tantric alchemy, uh, the idea was to encourage sexuality. On the Western side, in, in uh, European alchemy, the idea was to sublimate this, uh, this energy. In other words, to take sexual energy and, and, and uh, change it uh, into a different type of energy, a more spiritual energy. Sublimation is actually a, an alchemical process of distillation where you go from directly from the vapor or the liquid in the distilling flask to the solid. There's no, there's no uh, thick phase between them where you, where you precipitate or anything. It goes directly to the, the, the solid. In other words, you're boiling a, a liquid and right there on the neck of the vessel, a solid powder uh, will uh, will appear. You can do this with sulfur and some other chemicals, where you get a very purified form of sulfur. And so sublimation is t going directly to a solidification or a manifestation of the energy, and uh, it, on a very pure, higher level. So it was in the Western tradition. It was taking these sexual energies and making them more innocent, more directed kind of um, taking sexuality away from overt expressions of climax and orgasm into um, more latent type of more childish, I guess, uh, feeling of what sexuality was as life force. So it's a little complicated to, to see that, but the, the differences between Western vitriol and Eastern vitriol are... are uh, interesting and the profound the kind of physical versus spiritual. Hmm. Yeah. And in the nineties, you worked with the American society for psychical research founded in 1885. Um, there's also a, the journal of the society for psychical research established in 1882 out of Trinity college in Cambridge. Is there any connection between the two? Oh uh, yeah. 
that that's uh, they are connected to the ASPR uh, uh, was originally a uh, academic uh, group and uh, they became a New York society New York based society um, I've always found uh, them to be uh, fair-minded and, um, and with a healthy skepticism in their in their materials and work and uh, so I worked with them uh, the reason I got into that kind of work uh, was when I was in uh, Europe and, and during my apprenticeship, I saw that mind was a big part of alchemy uh, and that uh, manifestations in concretism, in other words, uh, making psychic uh, and uh, imaginal entities real in the world uh, was very similar to what I'd heard was going on in, in paranormal research like poltergeist events and and things like that so i wanted to see if perhaps the proof of an alchemical process being real in the world uh, could be found in paranormal research so i spent a long time um in uh, paranormal research uh, i found it disappointing uh there's so much um mistaken uh interpretations wishful thinking uh, hoaxes and so much noise, if you will, in uh, paranormal research that it was kind of a waste of time for me. I did, I did find uh, some um, significant events, but they were very rare. Uh, so it kind of distracted me, and then I got back on the alchemical track um, about ten years after I returned from uh, Europe. Hmm. Um, what were some of the significant actual events that you did come across with? Your research. But there were uh, certain cases I investigated that were undeniably real that the people involved were not hoaxing. The one was uh, Grass Lake in in northern Illinois, by not far from Rockford, a little uh, lake, and a community of farmers there who uh, lived in maybe eleven different households that lived around the lake, and they were reporting. Um, really strange stuff. They were reporting UFOs landing in the forest behind them, and that uh, from the forest, these uh, reptilian creatures were emerging, and uh, uh, but, and they had documentation, they had uh, pictures they were sending, and they were reporting this all to the uh, Northwestern University, to Dr. J. Allen Heineck, of the Center for UFO Studies, who I was associated with at the time. And uh, being kind of the low man on the totem pole there, I was sent out to investigate uh, these cases. So I went up there and I spent several days. There was no doubt that the people I talked to believed what they were saying. They were terrified. But the description of the events were so far out and so hard to believe that these reptilian creatures were running through their houses. They disappear into walls. They um, they appear at the foot of their beds at night. Uh, they never really hurt them, although some of the recipients had scratch marks on their bodies. But even the children were describing these things, and uh, I I couldn't detect anyone lying, you know, overtly or making up stories. So that intrigued me, and I I stayed there to interview people. And one person who was keeping a log of all this was, Na her name was Nancy Hennessy. And uh, one day I was sitting down at her table, kitchen table, and she was, we were going through her, her log book of all these events that were taking place around the lake. And um, I was, to be honest, I was thinking it was a case of mass hysteria at the time. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, there was this big bang on the side of the house. The house was like hit by a, a hurricane force wind, maybe, or something like that. But the whole side of the house just kind of moved in, you know, the, almost moved the whole house. So something like hit the side of the house. And I went to a dining room window that was, that was open, and I peeked my head out to see what hit the house, really expecting some kind of meteorite or something. I saw these uh, claw marks on the side of the house, five-fingered claw marks, and they were digging into the 
this uh, faded cedar siding on the side of the house. And it looked to me when I looked out that they were still forming uh, maybe a uh, half inch or so. Uh, uh, so that was uh, like a con shocking confirmation of what they were telling me with my own eyes. And they could have, these marks could have been there before. And it was just my movement making me uh, think these were, you know, being formed at the time. But I did see these these claw marks, so I definitely documented it, went out to pictures again, uh, continued my work there, and um, I never really come to a good conclusion. I couldn't prove mass hysteria, but I couldn't prove it was genuinely uh, reptilian creatures because I never saw anything like that. But then on my way the, that evening uh, when I left uh, Grass Lake, I was driving down this dirt road, leaving the area, and my car's headlights started flashing in Morse code fashion. I mean, really, uh, like a deliberate message coming across or something. And then my car stopped, it, and all the electricity in the car stopped. So I'm thinking I had a short somewhere, or the battery cable was loose. And, uh, and so I opened my trunk to... Uh, get some tools and look at the battery. But uh, when I opened my trunk, I had this uh, these instruments in there. One was a Geiger counter, another was an electric, uh, electromagnetic uh, device to measure le electromagnetic fields, which are sometimes associated with these, these phenomena. But the Geiger counter was pegged out at its maximum level. Uh, some, it was off, and yet the, the meter was pegged out totally. The the whole Gaga counter had gotten an overload of electromagnetic energy. And the uh, the meter, the electromagnetic e F meter uh, was also uh, burnt out because of an overcharge of, of uh, electromagnetic energy that came from someone. Uh -huh. So anyway I went I went to the um there's nothing wrong with the battery or anything like that. Um, the light started flashing again, and the, the car eventually started. So I, I told this to Dr. Heineck, who's, you know, skeptical. And uh, he told me to take the car to a garage <laughs> and have it fixed, you know, on their on their money. He's, he thought I was worried about the damage to the car and my instruments. But uh, I did do that. And um, the garage mechanic, when I went to pick up the car, said there's something unusual about this car. And he, he showed me that the... The left hand, the driver's side of the car, was uh, magnetized, and the right right hand side wasn't. It was like a polarity. Uh, he took a screwdriver and, and it stuck to the door, and then slid down a little bit. So, well, something definitely happened to my car and what was in it at Grass Lake in a physical manifestation of of events that um, honestly uh, took me back and. Um, uh, I remember being on that road and having all that happen and feeling that this is something real happening, some type of perhaps a synchronicity in the Jungian sense, but also perhaps reptilian creatures or entities or tulpas or imaginative energies that are forming uh, what, according to people's expectations, and taking a reality. So that was um, kind of a confirmation kind of confirmation I was looking for. Wow, that's fascinating. And I think you you served as an advisor mathematician to MUFON as well. I've heard of MUFON, but to be honest, I don't really know much about it. I think I heard it mentioned in a, on the Black Vault Radio podcast by John Greenwald Jr. Um, what What is MUFON exactly? Uh, MUFON is the uh, Mutual UFO Network. Oh, okay. uh, it. It, uh, it's the largest um, private UFO investigative group in, in the country. And uh, I was involved with them at the early stages. It was formed by Walt Andrews of, of Motorola uh, and uh, another organization with high principles uh, looking for truth. I was editor of the MUFON UFO Journal and tried to, uh, in all my work in the paranormal, I tried to emphasize kind of scientific research in the in the idea or expression of trying to look for what's really true, what's really going on. Because there is politics 
in the paranormal. There's there's ego in the paranormal. We can see that on television now with all these paranormal investigative um, groups and and there's lies and there's hoaxing and there's a lot of wishful thinking too in the public. Uh, but at base, I think there's something going on there that uh, is not necessarily what we expect, not necessarily aliens, you know, visiting us, but some type of energy at work there. And uh, so MUFON uh, fit with uh, each other. We helped each other, I think, uh, over the years um, get good information. Uh, but it's a lot of work, actually, to, to approach the paranormal in that way. You have to do a lot of you have to do a lot of filtering of uh, people's often hysterical, often maniacal sometimes uh, interpretations. Everybody wants to form a philosophy or find their own religious truth in these kinds of paranormal phenomena. And uh, that really gets in a way, it makes it hard. Yeah. So I want to go back to the, the Umbrella tablet. Um, it's an essential foundational alchemical text. Um, and is this something that has possible et origins i know you mentioned mentioned thoth um do you think thoth was actually a physical being uh i think uh, again in the in the egyptian teaching especially in uh, in the ancient text uh, um, thoth was treated as a real person in fact he arrived during a time in Egypt called Zeptepi, which was a time when these uh, these special beings, uh, there were nine of them that arrived in Egypt and transformed everything. They brought new teachings, and um, Toth himself was the, the god of uh, mathematics and for agriculture, of anything that required thought and teaching. Toth is the god of thought. And uh, the idea was that... Uh, um, in Egypt, the idea was that Toth could enter our lives because he was a spiritual being, but he was concrete too. In other words, they believe that when, when you were inspired with something or you had uh, uh, knowledge that can't, seemed to come from somewhere else, that was Toth. In fact, the, the most common greeting in, in Egypt at the time was, may Toth speak to you daily. In other words, so it's a very active it's not the way we treat God as a distant, a powerful force, but as an everyday presence in our lives. So I think that um, Toth was real in that sense. Uh, whether Toth was a real visitor from uh, another dimension or another um, uh, world, I've never found any proof of that. Or There's a lot of speculation about it. Yeah. But I think in the in his teachings in the Corpus Semeticum, you can sense the idea of um, uh, of a, uh, both a spiritual and a physical force. In fact, just let me read the Emerald Tablet. Uh, it'll only take a, a minute here. Oh, and maybe you can get a sense of, of what I'm talking about. Yeah. In truth, in truth, without deceit, certain and most veritable, that which is below corresponds to that which is above. And that which is above corresponds to that which is below, to accomplish the miracles of the one thing. And just as all things have come from this one thing, through the meditation of one mind, so do all created things originate from this one thing, through transformation. Its father is the sun, its mother the moon. The wind carries it in its belly. Its nurse is the earth. It is the origin of all, the consecration of the universe. Its inherent strength is perfected if it is turned into earth. Separate the earth from fire, the subtle from the gross, gently and with great ingenuity. It rises from earth to heaven and descends again to earth, thereby combining within itself the powers of both the above and the below. Thus you will obtain the glory of the whole universe. All obscurity will be clear to you. This is the greatest force of all powers because it overcomes every subtle thing and penetrates every solid thing. In this way was the universe created. From this comes many wondrous applications because this is the pattern. Therefore am I called thrice greatest Hermes, having all three parts of the wisdom of the whole universe. Herein have I completely explained the operation of the sun. 
So that is a statement that you can really sense uh, that's talking about a bigger process, that it's talking about a fundamental process, not only in the little universe of the microcosm that we live in, but in the macrocosm of the whole universe itself. And not only that, but in the Gridelian sense of what lies beyond the universe, but what will complete our understanding that, that outside uh, one thing or one mind um, that was there from the beginning. So there's a, there's a secret formula in here. There's chemicals in here uh, that the Egyptians associated with each stanza of the um, of the Yemer tablet. There's a spiritual initiation process concealed in these words that is the same in the Rosicrucian movement as it is in the Illuminati and the uh, uh, every other hermetic orientated group that uh, that we've heard about, good or bad. I mean, Freemasons, uh, the OTO, the Golden Dawn, I mean, uh, every group like that has its basis in this document that wow. I just read. Yeah, I wanted to get you to talk, what was the time call? You called it the time of Zepe Tepe? Zep Tepe. Zep Tepe? Uh, Z-E-P. What, what are some... Yeah, um, P-I. What are some of the historical resources or references that if somebody was interested in learning about that, they could go to? Uh, uh, the time of uh, Zep Tepe uh, is uh, historically documented in the Egyptian text. Uh, you see it in the uh, Book of the Dead and uh, also in the, uh, well, all the way down to like 1500, which is the Papyrus of Annie, uh, which is by the way the, the, the oldest written text in the world, um, which is an alchemical text, uh, although it's mostly recipes for beer, <laughs> but <laughs> it's basically an, an alchemical text. And um, you see the same kind of references to uh, Toth in the original uh, nine visitors who, who gave us, uh, who are the fundamental basis of Egyptian religion. and. Um, they arrived during this time called Zeptepi when um, when giants came to the, to the world. And literally, that's how it's described. Whether these were physical giants or just giants of mind and, and different uh, expressions of spirituality um, can be open to interpretation. I've seen it interpreted both ways. And, but um, it's a period that dated in some texts as far back as 40,000 years ago. In the other texts, about 10,000 years ago, but sometime in that period, sometime before the Great Flood, uh, which took place around 10,000 BC, really um, in, in, and is mentioned in uh, many different uh, cultures around the world, something definitely happened back then. And uh, that there was one world before the flood and one world after the flood is part of many myths. And, and and cultures, and so I think it was a real event that Septepi um, um, and many scholars will concur on this was a real time period when something unusual was going on in Egypt at the time, and uh, what it was uh, has to do with Toth and the Toth and teachers, the Corpus Amaticum, um and it uh, seemed to be like it a spiritual inoculation, if you will, of our culture. And the great leap in um, intellect and the great leap in uh, understanding that, that occurred to our species at the time. So many, uh, many, uh, well, I won't call them scientists, but many speculators uh, like Colin Wilson and others have said that uh, um, this was a time when um, our Genetic, genetic code was uh, was altered by these visitors that uh, our, um, our very nature, our very structure physically and mentally was brought to a higher level much faster than it would have been. So this may be because fall... Because there was this spurt in evolution. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Fall into the time of the um, Sumerian tablets that were 
stored in the library of Ashurbanipal. I, I believe they have some kind of texts that resemble what you're saying with the manipulation of DNA in reference to Enli and Enlil and Enki. Is that similar? Oh yes, very very much. Uh, uh, Enki and the the whole mythology of, of uh, Babylon and Samaria um, is exactly the same time period. Also, the in, in Phoenicia, there were some writings. Uh, so the Emerald Tablet has been dated back to that time period. Wow. And then, yeah, I've been researching this idea lately um, about the, I don't know if you're familiar, it's a text called The Instructions of Amenonope and its relation and resemblance to the biblical Proverbs of Solomon. Have you came across that? I've heard that about that in connection with, uh, yeah, with Solomon and even some of his psalms that, uh, that survived in the Bible. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not not not, in, not into it too deep, but I have heard of it. It's kind of a place where I want to go next to look at things. It's very interesting. So, from an alchemical perspective, how would you define the Word of God? the The Word of God is very uh, specific meaning in alchemy and hermetic teachings. It's the logos or the uh, the initial vibration that brought matter and created uh, our world. So um, the word uh, uh, is a very special idea and a very powerful idea because we have that same ability within us, according to Hermetic teachings. We, through the word, through organizing and projecting our mind in a concise way, can create reality just as the whole universe was created. So the Big Bang was kind of an expression of the Word of God in some traditions. The Word itself was that very vibration that exploded into our universe, that carried consciousness and carried this organizing principles and patterns that the Emerald Tablet talks of into reality. So in the physical scientific tradition, we have the Word explosion into the Big Bang. And on the spiritual level, we have the same type of idea um, that having a word, having thought, uh, creates reality. Okay. And I know you've, um, to, just to touch on mystical experiences, I, I believe you had a, a few mystical experiences that had to do something with your time in motels and a specific uh, reoccurring event with the Bible. Can you speak to that? Uh, yes. In fact, that you know, I've had a lot of uh, synchronicities, which, which in the Jungian sense are confirmations of this type of idea. But um, I'd uh, uh, when I was when I get into these uh, questing modes, and uh, like anyone else, you you want to find out and you want to become um, enlightened or, or understand what's going on. It becomes like an obsession. And things seem to fall into place, whether it be the library ghost and a book um, all around you. And I'd be, I, sometimes I'd, um, uh, in order to earn money in my life, I'd go out and take contract jobs, you know, mostly programming uh, automation and plants and things like that. So I did do some traveling. And when I did that time of work, uh, there seemed to be, because of my focus on other things, there seemed to be a, a a force to counter that and come back with spiritual ideas. So often, um, for a period of uh, almost a year, when I when I check into a a motel room, the Gideon Bible that was there was somehow uh, open or stained or had a big piece of fruit or something sticking to it, open to the page of the Psalms. And Psalm 19, Psalm 91, the alchemical, um, alchemical, known as the alchemical Psalms, and, um, had a message to me about um, returning to the spiritual and uh, not giving up on that path and balancing material and spiritual ideas. Often I have um, dreams uh, that would um, coalesce these type of ideas in, in very meaningful ways. I think. I think um, the, the most profound dream I've had about 
alchemical forces um, took place on these trips. It, it involved, um, I was studying the uh, Tabulus Monogenium, which is a, a drawing from uh, 1590 uh, about uh, the forces of alchemy, about the above and below. Tabula smartadina is the Latin word for t emerald tablet. And it was a graphic depiction of the emerald tablet, uh, which you can find online. I've done some colored versions myself. But um, it was a perfect coalescence of um, alchemical ideas. It's a way of time. I can just go through that dream real quick. Uh, yeah, for sure. I, it, it start. It started on, um, I was on a uh, totally black, uh, horizonless uh, plateau or plain. It was very flat. And all around me were these uh, people stuck in piles of manure or some type of sticky, foul substance. And there were millions of thousands of them as far as the eye could see. Again, no horizon anywhere. It was all blackness. But it was just people like me stuck in stuck in these piles of manure and I was stuck in my own pile of manure <laughs> and this sticky stuff that I couldn't I was lifting my legs trying to get out and uh, and I was trapped it was like hell uh, and then next to me I saw a child uh, stuck in a pile too but it was not manure it was tiny little seed and the child was drowning in, in these seeds uh, or of life, like life, like life force, and the child was uh, here. I am stuck in my own pile of shit, if hmm. you will. But this child was drowning in his own um, in the life force itself. Uh, I couldn't tell if it was a male or female, but it was definitely going down like it was struggling for survival. And seeing that child made me move out of my pile of manure and into it and, and trying to save it. So I was able to escape only through seeing this child in distress. And then I pulled the child out and grabbed it to my chest. And as soon as I grabbed it, um, we both started rising up together alongside of a huge mountain, tall mountain with a, a sheer rock face to it. And we just rose up and rose up. And it was a wonderful feeling of escaping from darkness and escaping from being trapped in matter, more or less. And it was as and we I rose, the child reached the plateau and there was disappeared a, or a rock cut into the so on the very edge. And I kept rising the plateau rising and uh, came to the on top, top of this of the pedestal, mountain, there were and three there was crystals a plateau there. just laying there. And I picked them up and they felt very smooth and satiny, like they were very ancient crystals. And it just felt very empowering holding these crystals, uh, knowing they had so much magic. Magic within them. And then from the pedestal, there was a, a path leading down into a, a dark cave. And so I followed the path down into the cave, and the cave was pitch black, and but it had a kind of a flat surface, and so I could walk into it. And I just walked into the darkness of the cave for a long time, and uh, finally there was a, a dim light that uh, showed up, and I walked towards that light, and um, uh, finally I I saw that the the light was coming from two buttocks <laughs> that were protruding out of the uh, side of the cave. In other words, two giant butt, but were two giant, <laughs> giant butt was sticking through the wall, and it was glowing. And uh, and yet, seeing that, uh, I recognized the sacredness of it. Uh, it seemed like a, something sacred. In fact, I went to the butt and I kissed it. Uh, <laughs> out of reverence to it so and i realized even within the dream that i was kissing the ass of god kind of you know <laughs> that god was on the other side god was on the other side of reality and the only thing that was sticking through on our side was this you know his ass and that's what we get you know it's kind of like we can't 
communicate with that other side except through what is occurring on our side, even though it's bad, doesn't make sense, and has, has connections and horrible things happen to us and uh, our pathetic lives. It's all part of God, you know? Yeah. Um, that was the revelation then. And uh, so I woke up right in the middle of the night, right, right with that dream, and I was sweating, and uh, it was a very profound experience that gave me an insight into the hermetic teaching and what they were really saying that, that we should force, that we should face uh, and force our minds to face what's real in the world. All the bad things, all the uh, calamities that happen to us, all the things that happen to our loved ones, um, and all the grief, there still is that light of love and understanding and that's what we should move towards, just like in the cave. Um, that's the purified part, and that's the uh, spiritual part of reality that we've kind of lost uh, connection to. Wow. Yeah, it sounds like a fascinating and meaningful dream, uh, as well as your experience with the Bible and Proverbs. Have, on another note, have you ever attempted to access any of the Vatican archives, I can't help but think they must be full of old alchemical manuscripts. Oh, yes, I've been to the Vatican. Um, in fact, I tried to get a scholar's uh, pass to the Vatican because uh, I wanted to study the hermetic teachings and documents that they had relating to Hermes. Um, but I was told that there are no such documents that Hermes wasn't recognized by the church and um, that the, there was no documents that were part of the um, church uh, teachings. Um, and that was very hard to believe because I knew there were documents in there uh, that, that were part of it. In fact, you know, during um, the 1500s or 1400s, um, her Dominic teachings were actually taught in some of the um, um, churches and some of the um, um, Vatican groups because they seem to support the idea of a God and the spiritual reality. But oh, then they, they started to realize, they started to realize what the hermetic teachings were really saying that, that you could achieve God within your own chambers, within your own world. And the church was really into controlling that, that gateway into heaven, you know, oh. giving it, giving it out. This passes sometimes. I mean, it's very, very um, disappointing the way the Catholic Church handled, handled things, I think. Anyway, uh, right there where you apply for the uh, um, passes into the archives in the entry to that area of the Vatican, there's a huge mosaic tile there that dates back many hundreds of years that shows a picture of Hermes in the standard pose of pointing to the above and the below and and, um, and teaching uh, other people. So right there in the Vatican, they have a confirmation that Hermes was part of the church at one time, but uh, they're telling me that they, there's nothing there to, to uh, document. Uh, so I, I think that the, the, the church and the history of the church is a good example of how spiritual Spirituality gets corrupted in our world uh, by becoming uh, materialized, by by becoming a power uh, over people. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you have time to get into it. Um, would you be able to briefly walk through the seven stages of the alchemical work? Oh, sure. Uh, the alchemical process. Um, or formula, which is in the Umber tablet, and also is um, part of the both practical alchemy work, in other words, the work in the laboratory, and the work in uh, on the spiritual level and the psychological level. Um, and this has certainly been verified by Carl Jung and psychologists like uh, Herbert Silber and uh, Edward uh, Edinger. Um, the alchemical process is very real in psychological and spiritual terms. But basically, it begins with a process of fire uh, called calcination, which calcination means reducing things to the white ashes, or reducing things to ashes. And it's a process of burning away the dross. In other words, 
you have to burn away the false things in your life. So that means to, uh, a disciplined approach um, to purifying yourself, to uh, purifying uh, the laboratory work, whatever the substance is you want to work with in the laboratory, uh, you have to burn it up or heat it up and uh, to get to the essence of it, which is its, its ashes or its, which basically ashes are the chemical components, the pure chemicals that are involved in structuring the, the uh, substance. And uh, that moves into uh, an operation of water known as dissolution. So you take these ashes in the laboratory and you dissolve them in acid or water sometimes. Uh, if you're working with an herb and trying to create a tincture or an elixir, that's a standard process. So you wash them, and washing uh, um, is kind of um, in the spiritual or psychological process is, again, of bringing them back to life or bringing, uh, adding life to them, to the, the dead or dregs of calcination. So in dissolution, in calcination, you're kind of killing things, destroying things, breaking them up in dissolution, you're bringing them back to life. Uh, calcination and dissolution are the two major processes we just go through in this endless cycle in our lives. It's calcination is thought, and you have to destroy thoughts or break them down or they become their own prison. And dissolution is uh, finding the thoughts that are real and bringing them back to life with emotions and uh, integrity and then moving on like that. So it's the same process within us and without us in the laboratory and in the whole universe too. And the next process then is called separation, which is uh, re removing the essences that you've discovered in the first two processes of uh, calcination and dissolution. Essences of who you are, uh, what you're about, um, you know, basically your soul, your essence. And that's the true of the, of the plants that the alchemists work with. In fact, they called it uh, the soul or the oil of the plants that they were recovering in separation. So it's basically a process of filtering and separating things out. Sometimes in your personal life, you have to separate yourself from persons and situations and uh, doctrines that are corrupting your life. Sometimes you have to break away like that, and that's what separation is. So the alchemy goes no further if you are not able to separate from society, from the dregs that have come before from connections to how you think and who you are. Uh, it's recovering the, your integrity or the, uh, the useful things and the real things in your world. And that, uh, that moves to the next operation, which is called conjunction, which is bringing together these essences. Um, the essences on the personal level you're working with are soul and spirit, soul being that unchangeable part of you that Part that really doesn't want to change that's uh, eternal along with uh, spirit which is your ambition and your need to transform and change and become something new so those two opposing parts come together in the sacred marriage in alchemy uh, which is an important stage where you try to form something new and move forward in laboratory too it's it's a conjunction of opposing forces that cause maybe a precipitate or something like that to come out of the experiment. And uh, that moves on uh, where you have created this child of the philosophers, they call it, uh, that new incarnation that uh, requires rebirth on a higher level. So now you're kind of working in the lower levels of the world in matter, but next you move into the higher world. It's kind of a turning point where you work uh, with the energies, and that's fermentation. Fermentation begins with a period of putrefaction and kind of a dark night of the soul, where you realize that uh, no matter what you do in the world, uh, this child you're trying to create is going to get crushed by the world. There's going to be forces at work in your family, in the real world, in your psychology, uh, from your own unconscious that are going to try to destroy 
this new thing you've created. So you need it to be reborn on a higher level. Fermentation is always some type of like psychedelic sometimes experience. Um, alchemists were chemists, you know, they knew how to, to use psychoactive compounds and uh, they were used uh, by the alchemists to try and break it through into a new reality. But it's also meditation and reflection and organized efforts to keep something alive that is only a fleeting idea, perhaps, or a fleeting interpretation of who you can be, of what the final result of the experiment will look like. Um, it's a big part of um, Rosicrucian teachings is this period of how to keep that thing alive um, and not let the world kill it off. And that requires, once you get the, the fermented, fermented uh, um, object or child of the philosophers, again, they call it that, um, you go through this process of distillation where it's a continued uh, uh, enhancement of this fleeting or fragile idea uh, you, where you move from the above and the below and you see it in different ways. So uh, it's a lot of imagination, a lot of meditation, going on about how to move from the below and that means your own unconscious how to go down there and also how to get out of there and move up into the light and rise up above things to get an objective view. So it's a distillation or a cycling between subjective reality and objective reality and it's a distillation between material energies and spiritual energies and it's a cyclic thing that eventually creates a unity between the two, um, a uh, higher marriage, if you will, or a true incarnation of something. Uh, that's how the universe works. It cycles between matter and energy, as we know. And it's the light of imagination or the light of uh, meditation, the light of the universe itself, the logos, that's um, creating this new reality through distillation, which is a long process both in the laboratory, in the universe, and in our own psychology. And the final stage uh, of coagulation or manifestation is really uh, no big deal. It's just if you've done the work before, coagulation suddenly happens on its own. There's not much you can do to encourage coagulation except to do the work, the great work, uh, in all its stages and comprehension earlier and that happens it happens through a grace of god it happens through the grace of the universe it happens through this mystical and great mystery in which we find ourselves and those are the seven steps of alchemy uh, which are the, the basis of hermetic teachings and laboratory work and uh, psychology spirituality and uh, our own uh, essence in the world. Wow, I love that. Um, well, um, do you have any last words for the listeners that you want to end this on? Uh, no, I just, uh, I just uh, am glad to uh, be among uh, people who are interested in these ideas. I think these ideas are going to continue in the world. It's, uh, it's a perennial philosophy that occurs no matter how people try to suppress it over the years. It's going, to, it's going to come, I think, and I'll predict that, that in the next uh, 50 years or so in our, in our country, as a backlash to what's going on in our country, as a backlash to what's going on in the world, uh, spiritual principles will become more real to us. And um, with millennials and with the younger generations, I see the, those ideas fermenting. I see them building in people's psychology and i think that's going to be a big change that that, that we're coming to and i'm just glad uh, i'm glad that uh, the old generations are dying off and i'm glad <laughs> the new generations are here to uh, to teach us how to live and yeah. uh, how to be real definitely agree with you well uh where can people find more about you and your work um where would you direct them uh, I have a website, uh, dwhauk.com, 
with a lot of links to my uh, my books and works. Uh, I also do a podcast at uh, alchemergy uh, dot com, which is um, I'm sorry, alchemergy dot net, which is a l c h e r m e r g dot net. And uh, I also work with the Alchemy Guild, uh, alchemyguild.org. They have a lot of resources and uh, archives of a chemical text. And, of course, uh, the Rosicrucian Museum, uh, which I'm curator of, uh, is an alchemy museum now. And we're going to be opening uh, the largest alchemy museum in the world, uh, hopefully wow. next year. And uh, so we'll have a lot of... Uh, exhibits where people can experience these, these different processes, the seven steps of transformation. And so I'm working wherever I can and um, to to bring these principles into reality in our everyday world. Yeah. Uh, Alchemy Museum sounds pretty cool. It's going to be on my bucket list. <laughs> so I'm excited for that. Yeah. Um, it's San Jose. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for doing this and i hope that you have a great day thank you skylar appreciate it